Hey everybody, Nick here. It is Monday night. Here we are on the Davis Park Church of Christ YouTube channel. We do this every Monday night, every Thursday night, in an effort to stay connected, to devote ourselves to God, to His Word, and to prayer. Uh, tonight we continue a study that we started last Monday night, should uh, land the plane today, talking about universalism. And um, we laid out the basic contours and structure of universalism, uh, presented a few uh, undergirding presuppositions that militate against the universalist position, and started tackling uh, one of the texts that is marshaled in support of universalism. Today we're going to look at the rest of the texts uh, that are utilized to argue for uh, universalism and uh, see what they say, and I think we'll see that they don't advocate anything close to what the universalist is advocating for. So, uh, with that as kind of our groundwork, you can turn to Romans 5. I'll meet you in Romans chapter 5 in just a minute. Let's worship our God in song. I just want to be where you Okay, and we're back. Um, just, again, a, a quick recap. Last week we 
started tackling universalism. This is the doctrine that says that all intelligent, moral creatures will be saved in the end. This would include not only all humans, but also all angels and demons. That's the doctrine proper, but usually people just mean it in terms of humans. Uh, all people will be saved. And again, we unpacked some of the uh, presuppositions that militate against that view last week, and I'll let you uh, watch that video for uh, more information on those. Today I want to deal with the texts. We looked at Acts 3, verse 21, and just kind of tackled that text last week um, as a, an appetizer for this week. Uh, it brings us to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. This is a text that uh, universalists lean into uh, because um, here they see all people in Adam being made righteous in Christ. Uh, the sin of Adam resulted in condemnation for all people. The act of righteousness, uh, the act of, of Christ's righteousness, results in justification and life for all men. And so that's the, that's the parallelism, uh, the, the parallel that universalists lean into. Uh, that's seen down here in verse yeah, 18. Um, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men. Well, doesn't all mean all? Right? Uh, and, and so in, in that way, they kind of uh, use um, our own arguments against us. Um, so what do we say to this? Well, here the word um, all uh, for all men is being pressed into uh, service that it's not intended to carry all this weight. Um, in addition, while all is stressed, um, the many here, which is there and here, that's often overlooked uh, or ignored all the way around. Um, or else it's equated to all. Well, many just means all. Wait a minute, you just said all means all. Doesn't many mean many, right? Um, which is why this text is it's tough. It's, it's difficult to, to work through. Um, Adam's sin, many were made, by Adam's sin, many were made sinners. Okay? Um, which is said, uh, yeah. Uh, one trespass led to the condemnation of all men. One man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Okay? And the one man here is Adam, without a doubt. Um, and so many here, that serves to restrict all. Um, and especially as it pertains to the obedience of Christ. One man's disobedience, that's Christ's disobedience, the many will be made righteous. So um, why does Paul write it this way? It's because he's contrasting two different humanities, two separate humanities. There's one that's in Adam and there's one that's in Christ. And so a proper reading of these verses, these two verses in particular, 18 and 19, would be something like this. We come here to verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, that is, all people in Adam, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men, that is, all people in Christ. You come here to verse 19. For as by the one man's disobedience, again, that's, um, that's Adam's disobedience. The one man's disobedience is Adam's. So the many, that is the many who are in Adam, were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, that's Christ's obedience, the many who are in Christ will be made righteous. Um <clears throat> Also, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the word here, uh, the phrase all men, um, especially as it's used by Paul, it could refer, refer to all, uh, to, to people from all over the world, Jews and Gentiles. Okay. All men would be that, Jews and Gentiles, uh, which is part of the larger argument that Paul is making 
in the early part of Romans. Everything had been driving toward that. Gentiles are under condemnation, chapter 1. Jews are under condemnation, chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me. The whole world. The whole world <coughs> is under condemnation in chapter 3. I got that cough button there. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah, it just this ties directly back to the, the larger argument that Paul has been making as we've been going through the book of Romans. Um, all human beings are condemned under the law. Um, but those who believe are justified. Uh, it's back in chapter 3, verses 20 through 24. Also, uh, 5 verse 17 deepens the distinction between those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, even the righteousness of God that is through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe, in chapter 3 and verse 22, and those who have not received grace and righteousness, and they remain under condemnation for their sins, um, here in verse 17. For if by one man's trespass death reigned through that one man much more, Will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So, um, no, context, 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 um, as well as uh, working through the argument as Paul has put it forward. Uh, once again, we see that this text simply does not have a leg to stand on. Well, again, there's a whole complex of verses that universalists like to lean into. Here's another one. Romans eleven thirty two. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that He might have mercy on all. There you go. And again, all means all. Well, again, this uh, this relates back to to what we saw there in verses, uh, uh, especially nineteen and twenty, here of Romans chapter five. Um, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Okay, so we're seeing disobedience and uh, mercy on the other hand here. So there's connection to um, Romans chapter 5. That means there's also connection to that argument that Paul was making there about all people in Adam being condemned, universal condemnation for all those in Adam, and justification to life for all people who are in Christ. Um. Also, the immediate context here demonstrates that Paul has um, people groups in mind. Um, I mean, if we just uh, back up here just a little bit, yeah, to verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has uh, come in. Um, Jews and Gentiles are in view here. And so, again, all in Paul, especially we see in the context, shows that um, he is speaking about all people, first to the Jews, and then to uh, the Gentiles, which just is where he started back in Romans chapter 1. Paul is consistent all throughout this. You have to chop him up and, and try and make him argue with himself in order to make universalism work. So having mercy, that he may have mercy on all, would be all people from both Jews and Gentiles. People from uh, the world over. Um, it's not God's going to show mercy on every single person who's ever lived. At least saving mercy. I mean... We want to talk about um, common grace and things like that. Well, he's he's abundantly gracious to all creatures, but specifically here, the mercy, especially in the context of Romans chapters nine, ten, eleven, is uh, uh, connected to salvation. Um, it's certainly true. We could talk about God's mercy being available to all people, and it's certainly sufficient for all people. But it's only efficient for those who are obedient to Christ. Um, God will show mercy on all who believe in Christ and 
repent and obey the gospel. So uh, that's really what is going on here. Again, if we're going to maintain that Paul could at least uh, keep a coherent thought for two verses, okay? Uh, otherwise, we just he devolves into incoherency because of those who are forcing a reading upon him that he didn't intend. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22. This is similar to the Romans 5 text, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, um, <clears throat> this is a, a key text for the universalist. Um, see, uh, all will be made alive in Christ. It's, it's obvious, right? Well, if you just keep reading, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, and not everyone belongs to Christ. <clears throat> uh, mostly because not everybody wants to belong to him. The challenge is, of course, to make sure that I unmute myself after pressing the cough button there. Um, those who belong to Christ also assumes there are those who do not belong to Christ, uh, those who are outside of Christ. And so th there's this asymmetrical parallelism that is evident here. While certainly all die in Adam in a universal sense, uh, all made alive in Christ are those all those who belong to him. Um, we come down here to verse uh, 28. There's another text here. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. All, right? um, all things brought in subjection to Christ. Um that's, again, a key phrase that's leaned into by the uh, universalists here, but that is not what is meant. Universal salvation is not meant by all things being subjected to him. Again, the context here torpedoes the universalist. There are clear allusions to Psalm 110 um, in this context. Um he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Um, that is, again, an allusion back to Psalm 110. Um, and the subjection that is being talked about here has to do with the enemies of Christ being made his footstool, as well as him destroying every rule and every authority and every power, uh, which is here in verse 24. So, um, that, of course, concludes the last enemy, which is death, there in verse 26. last enemy to be destroyed is death. So, um, God, being all in all, does not mean universal salvation, but rather it means the final glorification of the triune God in bringing those who belong to Christ to glory, while also uh, destroying every rule and authority and power that has set itself up against Christ and uh, the Lord. Uh, next, Philippians 2. What is it? Verse 11, I believe. Yeah. Um, I guess it's 10 and 11 here. So that every knee, excuse me, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I've heard this uh, uh, referred to as um, a text that deals with posthumous um, opportunities at salvation. That what is pictured here with every knee bowing in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confessing, this is having to do with after death, and perhaps even eschatologically. Um, it's certainly the case that here, th this is eschatological, um, the glorification of God the Father at the end of time, with the confession of every single being that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Um, but this uh, every this confession by every tongue is not a saving confession. When you do it in time, and and seek to obey the gospel, yeah, it, it results in salvation. But pictured here, even the uh, rebel who all their life refused to acknowledge Christ was a God hater their entire life. Even they, this is part of bringing every enemy under his feet, making them a footstool. Um, this is a confession to their condemnation, not to their salvation. They are condemned as they confess this because um, uh, it is compulsory. What they refuse to do in their life, they are forced to recognize at the end of time. Also, I mean, contextually, you have enemies of the cross. Um, their end is destruction later on in chapter 3. Um, that's contrasted with citizens of the, the kingdom. So, um, yeah, this is um, not a text which serves the universalist very well. Uh, next up, Colossians 1, verse 20. Ah, uh, yes. Um, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell bodily, chapter 2 says, and through him to reconcile him to himself all things, uh, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Um. This is where universalism proper dwells, this text right here. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, uh, everything, all beings, human and angelic, things on earth and in heaven. Um, so clearly, Paul was a universalist here when he wrote to, Col to the Colossians. Well, um, no, <laughs> First of all, we notice the context here. Just the rest of the verse, there's a clear reference to the atonement, right? The blood of his cross. Uh, that's how peace is made. Um, and, and how do you respond to the crucified Christ? Uh, also, uh, you keep reading in this context, the, it talks about those who are alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, uh, but now are reconciled by God, through the death of Christ. Um, this particularly militates against universalism. Um, that there are those who are now presently reconciled to God. Um, and in fact, I mean, just the way these things, when, when you read something, as you keep reading, you get further Clarification. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Those who are alienated and hostile in their minds. Um, and again, you keep reading. Uh, context just annihilates universalism. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. Continued steadfast faith in Christ is required. Without faith, there is no reconciliation. Um, also, others have pointed to the nature of reconciliation. Reconciliation is where you were once at war, there was hostility, and now there you've been made friends again. Uh, that's There's peace now because of the, the Lord and what he has done. Um and so one either remains reconciled or one remains unreconciled. Second um, Corinthians 5, what is it? Look at 20 here. <clears throat> um, nope, need to go back one more verse. Yeah. Um, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation, once again in view here. Uh, verse 19, that is, <clears throat> in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the, ministry, the message of reconciliation. Um, 
Again, the assumption here is that world means every single person who ever lived. <clears throat> um, however, we notice, again, you just keep reading, not counting their trespasses against them. Just having a rough go of it here with my throat. That just is, not counting their trespasses against them, that just is language for Christians. And again, world here would <clears throat> be inclusive of both Jews and Gentiles. Um, also, uh, look, just the context here. Follow, follow the, the pronouns. Us, okay, whoop. Uh, us, okay, uh, us. This is Christians. Paul is writing to Christians. And, um, and then <clears throat> it's the church who takes the message of reconciliation out into the world. So, uh, again, just context, context, context really does a world of good. Last but not least, um, this is a text which is... Uh, Parallel to Colossians 1, uh, 20. And so I think the same critique applies here. To unite all things in him. <clears throat> things in heaven <clears throat> and things on earth. Um, a lot of people like to latch on to this particular verse. Um, for various reasons. Um, I've, writ I've written a research paper on this. It's available on my website um, as a response to open theism. And I forget exactly off the top of my head um, why the open theist grabs hold of this verse. But the universalist likes that to unite all things in him, um, which, again, the... The Colossians 1.20 text is similar to this. But again, the larger context, and it starts in verse 3, it runs all the way to verse 14, is just rife with examples of we and us language, uh, for one, that, that militates against the universalist. But um, another troubling shortcoming of the universalist reading of this text is the unification of all things in Christ is, um, well, it's, it's written in uh, the Aorist tense, which um, it, it can be taken as a past tense uh, verb, although, I mean, context will dictate that. And I think um, the context here is appropriate to recognize here that what is in view is the fullness of time, which is language that has to do with the coming of Christ when he came the first time. Um, it, had, it has to do with um, the accomplishment of the plan of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the redemption of people. Um, and also, uh, it, it connects to the exaltation of Christ in his ascension. And so all things are under Christ's feet right now. And in fact, he is Lord over those things on behalf of the church. Again, if we keep reading here, he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. Um, this is one reason why God can work all things according to the counsel of his will. That's what it was. It's verse 11 that's a, the, the key text for the open theist because um, according, uh, according to the the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Um, one of the reasons why God <clears throat> can work all things according to the counsel of his will is because he's put all things under Christ's feet. And they, that's, that's, a, that's an accomplished reality. Um, and so this, this is not an eschatological context. That is a, a, a text that deals with the end of time. So 
close reading in context of each of these texts eliminates the confusion and even the contradiction that universalism introduces. Universalism fails to attain as a <clears throat> biblical doctrine through exegesis of the scriptures, merely pulling from the text what it says. This is why I conclude that uh, universalism is unbiblical and should be rejected, again, on exegetical grounds. Um, hmm. Let me just say one more thing. I sometimes hear people say, well, but I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just a hopeful universalist. Hopeful that, you know, God will somehow, some way, save everybody. Okay. First of all, um, that is not a um, biblical way of thinking about hope. That's just wishful thinking. Okay. Um, so, uh, that simply won't do. Uh, second, you know, since the case cannot be made objectively through careful exegesis of the text, you're taking a more subjective approach to Scripture. And um, so, you know, something cleaner, nicer is offered, right? Because hell's too hot. It's too awful. Um, somehow it's unbecoming of a holy deity. We need a cleaner option, and, and that cleaner option is universalism. It's, it's just more user-friendly. It's more pastorally sensitive. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just I'm a hopeful universalist. But it needs to be pointed out, again, um, this isn't biblical hope. Biblical hope is not just wishful thinking. And also, assuming a biblical definition of hope, then our hope ought to be that the judge of all the earth will do what is right, will do what is just according to the holy counsel of his will. Now, if one wants to say, look, the very clear, plain teaching of Scripture says eternal conscious punishment. But I sure hope I've misunderstood this very clear and plain teaching so that somehow everyone is saved. If someone wants to say that, well, that's an altogether different discussion. But that usually isn't what is being said or, or advocated for. All right, a lot more could be said. I, I think universalism is a philosophy uh, in search of a biblical text. But again, uh, we've just taken out the legs of, of every single text that they might try to stand upon. Okay. We do want to go to our um, prayer requests here. We have uh, several that are before us. And so uh, right where you are, I want you to invite the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to come and be with you. And as we draw near to God, God draws near to us. <clears throat> Father in heaven, please help us to develop a deeper desire for time with you each day in worship, in prayer, in Bible reading. We want to spend more time with you every day. We thank you for always being near to us when we turn to you. Please help us to be aware of your presence with us at all times. Help us to be holy for you. And may we remember your love for us and draw near to you each and every day. Mindful of this, we do want to lift up a number of requests to you. Confident that you'll do even more than we ask or imagine. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, especially the Langford family at this time. Walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death. Buoy their spirits and remind them of your abiding presence. We pray that Julia Galloway makes full recovery following her surgery. We pray for those who are battling cancer, and there are so many here on our list before us. We commit them all to you. Where there are doubts, we pray you would grant faith. Where there is despair, we pray you would grant hope. Where there is sorrow, we pray you would grant joy. And according to your sovereign power, we pray you would grant healing as you deem fit. We have many other requests that are before us uh, as well. And we pray that uh, the radiation treatment for Ethan goes well. For Kathy D., we pray that you help her to make full recovery. We pray that 
Vanessa Foxford's ear infection clears up, and we uh, pray for our brother Bob as he has uh, spots that are going to be removed soon for uh, the legal custody issues concerning uh, Paula Mueller's boyfriend, Ian, and uh, his child for Mike Hampton, we pray that he gets HUD approval quickly and pray that he gets to feeling better. For uh, Brielle Tucker, we pray that you grant her strength and, and health. For Mike Martinez, we pray that uh, you grant him good health and help him with uh, kidney disease. Kidney disease. <clears throat> for Judy Cree, we pray uh, that you continue to be merciful for this longtime servant of yours for... Um, Christine Johnson, we pray for the, the, that the brain bleed would heal and uh, that there would be no residual effects from the possible stroke for Darla and Sinson. We pray that you continue to grant her healing for the conflict in the Middle East. We pray that you bring it to an end. And also, um, what's going on with Russia Ukraine, we pray for that conflict as well. For Carol Day, we pray that uh, you continue to strengthen her. For Sandy Sullivan, we pray that you heal her broken back from an injury. We pray that you grant full recovery. Following the fall, uh, for Lou Wade, please spare his eyesight. For Sarah Rios, we pray that you uh, help with recovery following a stroke as well for Leva Lightfoot. Uh, clear up the housing situation uh, for the uh, patents. For um, Ethan, we pray that he makes full recovery after the serious injury. For um, the Stovalls, strengthen their family uh, during the season of difficulty. For the various families that are dealing with uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, both the patients and caregivers, be merciful. For Jim Cook, we pray that you grant him repentance. For Suzanne, we pray that you strengthen her heart. For Liberty Rust Camp Woods and John Russell, we pray that you grant them good mental health. For John and Sheila, we pray for their health issues. And for Brittany, we pray that you help her make better life decisions. It's so good to know, Father, that you'll do even more than we ask or imagine. And so we commit all of these to your merciful care. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. We are our beloved. His desire is for us. Abba, we belong to you. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and evermore shall be, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me on this Monday night. I know there's a lot you can be doing on a Monday night. Glad you chose to spend just a little bit of time with me this evening. Hey, Thanksgiving this week. And um, <clears throat> I haven't talked with him directly, but I believe that um, uh, Thursday evening there will we'll suspend um, the prayer and devotional that night. Um, I know Buddy will have a long day, um, both Wednesday and Thursday, and it is Thanksgiving, the holiday. So, um, but, you know, bolo, right? Um, no midweek service this week either. We have uh, suspended midweek services in light of the holiday. Uh, so there is that. Well, I believe that's going to do it for me. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. May God richly bless you, my beloved siblings. Until next time, have a good evening. God bless.